everybody, welcome to Song and Sword Online Community Church. I'm so glad you're back. If you're brand new, welcome to this whole new experience. Uh, we've been doing this for uh, 19 months, but uh, we're glad you're here with us today visiting. Go to songandsword.com and check out all that we have. Um, text prayer to that number that's on the screen. We want to pray with you and for you about whatever's going on in your life. And at the end of this sermon, we are going to uh, take communion together. And today, it's maybe even more important that you gather some em uh, emblems representing the body of Christ and something representing the blood of Christ. And I hope you're gathered with your family or roommates or somebody together because um, we're going to be talking about this thing called communion today as we continue our series, The House of the Lord. I, actually, some of the happiest most fun-filled moments of my entire life, as I remember back in my childhood, the best I can remember, are um, what, that, what they used to call fellowship dinners at the church. Um, these big meals that were after church, um, sometimes they're called pitch-in dinners, because everybody was supposed to pitch in something, bring a dish to share. Uh, sometimes they called it a potluck, which I was never a fan of. It's like, hey, I brought this pot full of stuff, good luck with it. Uh, so potluck or fellowship dinner or pitch-in dinner Whatever it was, it was usually in this place called the Fellowship Hall in the basement of the church where there was a kitchen and a bunch of long tables, kids running around. And I remember this being one of the places where in the church you laughed and you joked and you ate some of the best food in the world. So the best I can remember, here are the top 10 kind of dishes that I grew up with and maybe some of you that guys that went to church, um, you can relate. If you didn't, man, you missed out on some great eating. Number one is fried chicken. There's always fried chicken at a pitch-in dinner. You can't go wrong with it. You know, some people buy it from KFC. Other people just made their own homemade. The only bad experience I had with that was my first church in Kentucky. Um, it was up the holler in Mount Victory, and the lady said, this is fresh kilt chicken. It looked like it had just been hit by a car. So fried chicken is a staple. Green beans and corn, if you're from Indiana like I was, or Illinois where we are now, uh, green beans and corn are going to be in every pitch in dinner. Somebody's going to bring that. Casseroles are a big thing. Casseroles are a big deal. Um, growing up, I remember one, it was called a cheeseburger casserole. It had basically tater tots and a hamburger and cheese. Pretty awesome. Green bean casserole. For some reason, people decided to bring uh, tuna casserole. I don't know why you would do that to kids. But anyway, um, there are other baked things like baked beans and macaroni and cheese. A lot of cool things you could just bake before and bring and warm up. Number four, salads. All kinds of salads. As a kid, I mostly skipped these, but they had, um, you know, broccoli salad and coleslaw. I can't prove it, but I think pasta salad was created uh, at fellowship dinners at churches. They also had this, uh, this thing called seven-layer salad. My mom used to make it all the time, but one of the layers was peas, and I didn't like peas at the time. They all, every place I've ever gone for a pitch and dinner, there are jello dishes. I don't know what happened, but in 1990s, Jello just got weird. For some reason, Jello was a big thing, and they made lots of desserts with it. And the one I can remember is one that had like uh, just grated up uh, carrots in it. I don't know why you put carrots in Jello, but they did. All right. Then also there were other meats. There were meats besides chicken. You get mostly meatloaf and sliced ham. Those are going to follow up. Always good. Then there are crockpot meals, maybe meatballs or some stews or some chilies. And then potatoes, again, I'm from the Midwest. It's a meat and potatoes kind of thing. So all gratin potatoes, mashed potatoes, potato salad, um, the hash brown kind of uh, what they call chopped up, I don't know what they're called, hash brown casserole. We call it funeral potatoes, but just big vats of potatoes baked with cheese. Um, and then bread, of course, you have to have bread, some kind of rolls or baked bread or cornbread. But the star of the show for me always was pie. That's what I was there for, pecan pie and sugar cream pie and apple pie and peach pie. I could go on and on and on. I don't know if, if you're hungry or not yet, but I've tried to make you hungry. And prayerfully, uh, when we get uh, forward a little bit in our new building, we'll have a place where we can do fellowship halls. We got some cleaning to do and some fellowship dinners downstairs. But um, why am I talking about eating together as the church? Well, it's because 2,000 years ago, the church began eating together. And it's been eating together for 2,000 years since. And these fellowship meals that became part of the communion process and what we do every week when we take the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so let's just get to the Word of God today. Uh, first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 17, the Apostle Paul talking about this church in Corinth. They really don't know what they're doing about communion. Here it says, here, here we go in verse 17. Uh, but the, in the following instructions, I do not commend you 
Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you are eating. For in eating, each one goes ahead of his, uh, with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord Jesus what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the, uh, the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us about this special meal that we celebrate in the church for 2,000 years. God, I pray that you would come now in this moment, that you would fill me with your spirit, so that um, by your preached word and lifting up your son Jesus, every heart, every soul, every person watching from any house or any apartment complex or any dorm room, wherever they're at, Lord, would you reach through um, this medium and would you touch them by the power of your word, by the power of Jesus, his resurrection, his death, and his burial, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, be with us now, and uh, let us understand this meal that you instituted all these years ago. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if we've been talking about the Lord's house, and in the Lord's house, there's his presence. In the Lord's house, it's a place of prayer for all people. And the Lord's house, like every other house, is a place for eating. It's where people eat together. Now, historically, here's what we know. Maybe you don't know this, but I'll give you a little bit of insight in what was going on in Corinth. What we know is that the early church celebrated communion, what Paul refers to here in verse 20 as the Lord's Supper. I think it's the only place in the Scripture that it says the Lord's Supper. So it's this dinner, this meal that Jesus has instituted, and it became uh, to be celebrated as a love feast. If you want to check this later, go to Jude Verse 17, there's no chapters in Jude, just one chapter. Jude 17, and he mentions a love feast. 20 years into um, the history of the church, which is when Paul wrote this letter to Corinth, they were celebrating what they called agape feast or love feast. It was the same as getting together with your bunch of friends and having like friends giving, all that stuff's coming up, or Christmas dinners. But it was an agape, it was a love feast based on the love of Jesus Christ and shared in love with one another. So what the early church started doing, really from the time of Jesus on, is they met together, they ate a big fellowship dinner with pies and cakes, probably not all that stuff, all the stuff that I talked about earlier. And then in the middle of that, they would stop and they would take the bread and they would take the wine and they would celebrate communion in the middle of this love feast. It's a beautiful picture uh, that during this pitch in dinner, they would remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ in community. But the problem is, is that um, people in Corinth were getting it wrong. I've said this before, if you, uh, if you don't think that you understand church or what to do in church or how people should act in church, then you should love First and Second Corinthians because they didn't either. That's why we have these great books. And the problem is that uh, this meal that had been established in Passover when Jesus first instituted it, was being messed up. And so Paul says, let me teach you some stuff. And here's the first thing he teaches us today. Here's the first point. The Lord's Supper is a shared meal. I'm, I'm specifically emphasizing that word shared. The Lord's Supper is a shared meal. Look what he says in verse 18. When you come together as a church, in fact, in verse 17 and 18 and 20, he uses this term of coming together. The church, remember the ecclesia in the Greek language, means to be called out to public assembly. So he's saying, when you come out together as a church and you're eating, um, it's the Lord's Supper that you're calling yourselves to eat. But the problem in Corinth was they were keeping the tradition of the feast leading into communion, but they were missing the sharing part. Did you see this? Did you notice what happens here? 
Paul says, in eating, one goes ahead of the other, verse 20, and with his own meal. And one goes hungry and another gets drunk. Now, this, understand this is a crazy pitch-in dinner in Corinth where the wealthy people are bringing their very best food and they're bringing all the finest things and they're bringing fine bottles of wine in Corinth. And Cor Corinthian uh, wine was, was you know, synonymous with quality back in the day. And then you have poor people in the church who are just bringing a few things in. And what was happening is people arrived at different times. The rich people were serving themselves. They were going ahead with their own meal. And, and what was happening, is actually Paul's describing is, there were some people who were full and even a little tipsy from having too much of Jesus' juice, the, the communion juice, and some were hungry and thirsty. And Paul says, no, this is called a love feast, not a selfish feast, not a serve yourself feast. It's a love feast. We're supposed to be expressing love to one another. So they missed the whole point, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And, and that really is uh, uh, unfortunate because... Jesus Christ, remember when He instituted the Lord's Supper, when He said, this is my body and this is my blood, He had washed His disciples' feet at Passover. So Jesus started this whole meal in the midst of servanthood. Can you imagine people being so selfish with their food and their wine that they were not sharing it with other believers that were a part of the fellowship? Guys, we come to this meal every week with a sense of sharing with a, a sense of doing this together. The Lord's Shep, uh, uh, Supper is a shared meal. Now, Acts 2.48 gives us insight into the heart of the shared meals of the early church. We joke about this all the time. When we have our life groups, it's like, okay, who's bringing brownies? Who's bringing what to drink and what to eat? And it's like, can Christians get together and not eat? Well, they can, but they just don't very much, and they haven't for 2,000 years. And here's why, because it's in our DNA. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it says, Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received food with glad and sincere hearts. There's nothing that equalizes us as coming together to, to share communion together. The Lord's Supper is something that is to be shared. Communion, I would say it this way if you're looking for a, a phrase. Communion is communal. It's supposed to be taken together. And we share it only in community. And I know some of you are watching online uh, right now and you're by yourself. I hate that for you because you can get the meaning of the body and blood of Christ, but it's better when we do it together. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says this is a unity marker of the church because there is one bread. We who are many are one body for we all partake of that one bread. Guys, we're sharing this together because Jesus shared bread and wine with us. And that's what makes us one. And so in just a few moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity for us to share, even though we're far apart, even though we're in this medium that's on YouTube, we're going to share this together because it binds us together. By the way, go all the way back to the original house of the Lord. This is extra stuff, but it's really cool. In the holy place of the tabernacle, there was a table, the first table mentioned in the Bible, as a matter of fact, that was called the table of showbread or the table of presence, the table of literally in Hebrew, the face of the Lord. It was right there in the tabernacle. And what was on this table? 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Eating bread uh, at a special shared meal is, um, is all the way back to the time of Moses. And so in just a few moments, we're going to celebrate that together. But, but the Lord's Supper is not just a shared meal. It's also a personal examination. I know that you've probably been taught in whatever tradition you grow up in, this is your time to examine yourself. It's also communal, but yes, there is a time for us to be very personal with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, in verse 28, did you hear, see what Paul wrote? He said, when you're getting ready to take communion, let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. The Lord's Supper is this rare weekly chance to do what we almost never do in this gig speed culture of ours. We are always going, we're always on the run. The next appointment, we got too much to go uh, with our kids' activities, with our activities, and with work, and with vacations, and we're go, go, go all the time. Communion, to me, is one time a week where we get to take a deep breath and slow down, and Paul says in verse 28, to examine yourself. The word for examine, we've learned uh, this before, and uh, I hope you uh, are learning along with me, is the word dokimazo in the Greek language, it has to do with testing whether a coin is authentic. In the marketplace where coins came from all over the world, 
there was a testing that said, yes, this is an authentic coin. It's really worth what it says it's worth. And Paul uses this word, word dokimazo about us examining ourselves. We can't come to the Lord's Supper without being authentic, without being real, at the very least being real with ourselves. And uh, we live in a culture that talks about being authentic and real and, and being who you are. Well, there's never a chance to get more real than when you come to the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is what David teaches us when he writes Psalm 139. I want to share this with you because I, I've used this a lot as a prayer to start my day, as a prayer to end my day, and as a prayer for communion. And I think this is helpful. Here's what it says in Psalm 139, verse 23 and following. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts, and see if there's any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. What a really awesome prayer. It's saying, God, you know my heart, you know my thoughts, let me know them. I heard uh, uh, recently a preacher say it this way that I really, it really resonated with me. Holy Spirit, show me me. Let me really be honest with who I am and what's going on in my world and the things about me that I don't like and the things about me that are going well and the blessings I've received. There's a time every week for us to get to the body and blood of Jesus Christ and really take a deep look, a personal examination. Let a person examine themselves. And, uh, and, and again, there's kind of a warning here, and this might shock some of you. I'm just going to give you a brief commentary on it. He says, listen, the reason some of you are dying and you're sick and you're not feeling too well is because you're not taking this thing serious. You're not examining yourself. And you're saying, well, pastor, are you saying that if you don't take communion seriously, if you don't examine yourself, if you take it in a flippant nature and uh, you don't care about really what you're doing in your heart, you're just eating bread and taking the wine um, that you might die? Well, the answer is, I'm not sure that this is saying you're going to die if you don't take it with the right attitude. I'm also not sure it's not saying you better take it with the right attitude. At the very least, um, we should take it very seriously. Take seriously the examination of our heart and the sacrifice that Jesus has given. So, the Lord's Supper is a shared meal. The Lord's Supper is a personal examination. And third, and this might be the point that's the point of all, the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of what He's done. Here's what it says in verse 24, after the body and after the blood in 25, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, if you would come to our church uh, tomorrow and you would, uh, we were able to see the, the, the sanctuary we're in and, and you were able to see the big table down in front, it says this do in remembrance of me. It's the communion table. I can still remember the big block letters on the communion table when I was six or seven years old at the church I grew up in. And in remembrance of me is the point. One of the first things I did when we started Song and Sword, because I knew we were probably going to do some gatherings. And for, so for the first um, Easter gathering we had in March of 2023 here in this place, um, I had a communion table because I knew that sharing the body and blood of Jesus Christ was going to be something we always were going to remember. And in fact, it's something that Jesus wants us to remember. Um, we, we, we have symbols around us all the time of remembering. In fact, we hear these words all the time, never forget. It can be something in a 9-11 memorial, never forget what happened there. Um, it can be something with a service, uh, somebody who was in the service, they served as a veteran in one of the armed forces. It can be someone who is a police officer who's died in the line of duty. Um, why do we name highways and streets and places after people who have died? Because we don't want to forget them. Why do we take the body and blood of Jesus Christ every Sunday? It's because Jesus doesn't want us to forget this incredible supper. We want to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And Jesus took the time to institute this. In fact, this again, if you like ancient stuff, you like history stuff, the body and blood of Christ is something that the body of Christ, the church, has taken together since Jesus was on the earth in around 33 AD. So it's this old tradition that reminds us of the sacrifice that God has given for us, remembrance of what Jesus has done. And this is interesting here because Paul received this from the Lord. you see that in verse 23? Paul received this from the Lord. In other words, Paul didn't hear it from somebody else. Paul's not researching here. Now, this is going to maybe confuse some of you guys, but 
When was 1 Corinthians written? Around 53, 54 AD. When was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written? Somewhere in the 65, 60s to 65 to 75 uh, time range AD. In other words, <clears throat> the oral tradition was sure. Jesus' body and blood had been celebrated, but, but Paul's writing it for the very first time. This is likely the first time, maybe it was a church um, saying and a church um, uh, you know, memory that they had, but Paul is saying, I received this in the vision that Jesus gave me, that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and said, do this to remember me. He took the wine, he said, do this to remember me. And, and, and that's how Jesus started the whole thing. Remember, he was at Passover. And all of Passover begins, and this is not the right kind of bread, this is wonder bread, this white and soft, but he would have this big, uh, this big piece of bread, this big matzah, and he would break it, and he would look to the heavens, and he would say the prayer over blessing. Jewish people still do this to this day. Every time they have a meal, they, they pray the prayer over blessing. By the way, this is really cool when it comes to communion. You might understand communion because it's communal, the Lord's Supper because it's the Jesus Supper, the Last Supper because it was the Last Supper Jesus ate. But why is it called the Eucharist? It's called the Eucharist in some traditions because the Greek word eucharisteo, you is the, the good uh, you know, um, part of the, the word there, and then charis is the grace part. So good grace, literally, or thanksgiving. Every time Jesus broke bread and every time the Christians broke bread, they said eucharisteo. So it's the Eucharist that they celebrate. Thanksgiving is a part of this. But I think there's something more than just being thankful for what Jesus has done for us. Matthew 26, 27, and 28, when Jesus is recorded as taking the cup, when He had given thanks, He gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is, listen, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now remember, all the way through this series, this is a really cool tie together. Um, the, the very first sermon, the Lord's presence, is by His covenant. Uh, the, last week's sermon, the Lord, uh, it, this Lord's house is a house of prayer for all people because of His covenant. And here again, the third time, it's the covenant. But Jesus says this is a new covenant. This is brand new. And the covenant is sealed by my blood because it's going to forgive your sins. This is what we remember. We come together to, in remembrance of Jesus Christ and we are thankful. But why are we thankful? We're thankful because His blood is a new covenant. I can't keep the old covenant because I break the rules and I sin and I mess up and I hurt people and I'm, you know, I'm just a human and maybe so are you. So what are we going to do? Well, there's a new covenant where Jesus comes and says, my blood is going to be poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you're there today, you're watching and you're going, I need some forgiveness. I need some grace. I need some mercy. I've messed up and I've lied and I've cheated and I've stolen and I'm not in a good place. I need God to cover my sins. I need forgiveness. I need my past and my sin and my shame to be erased. Guess what? You're in the same boat of all of us. This is why we come every week to remember that there is a way for all of our sins to be forgiven. If you're watching right now and you're not a follower of God through Jesus Christ, consider this. There is a sacrifice and there is a meal that can take all of your sins away. His name is Jesus Christ, and He's given His life for you. So this is a shared meal. Uh, it's a personal examination. So we're doing this together. Um, I'm examining myself and seeing what's going on in my heart. I'm remembering what Jesus has done. And there's one more thing. By the way, in just a few moments, we're going to gather together and we're going to remember what Jesus has done. But there's one other thing that we can't miss in this teaching here. Remember, these people were messing communion up. And Paul goes, let me just set you straight here a little bit. And finally, this is the final point, the Lord's Supper is a proclamation of our hope in Him. In our hope, what is hope? Hope looks forward to the future. The Lord's Supper is a proclamation of our hope in Him. Look at what it says in verse 26. What did the Lord say at the end of this meal where He's breaking bread and He's sharing the wine together saying, this is my new covenant? Here's what He says in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Jesus is saying this meal, this ritual that we share every week, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, is looking forward to something. In fact, He says it's a proclamation of my death until I come. 
This weekly meal is, a, is, a, is a, literally a sermon. The word kantagalete means literally to preach, to tell something. And so when we take the body and blood of Jesus Christ, you become a preacher and I become a preacher. It might be the best sermon that you hear this whole day because I'm going to declare to you in just a moment by taking the body and blood of Jesus Christ that there is something more to come. See, here, who do we preach to when we take communion together? Well, we take it in community because we preach to other believers. We remind each other that we have been blessed to have this sacrifice, and we also remind each other that Jesus is coming back. You know, Jesus says, you proclaim the Lord's death until I come. Why is it so important that we proclaim the Lord's death? Because the whole crux of Christianity is death, burial, and resurrection. So why would we brag about Jesus dying? We brag about Him dying because He rose from the dead, and that's the hope that we have. When we take communion every week, we're saying, yeah, Jesus died, we remember, but He didn't stay dead. And this meal is also a sermon to the world to a world of life and pain and death that surrounds us. Um, I don't know how you get through this life without knowing that there's something beyond the death that all of us face. And, and this, uh, this weekly meal declares to the world that there's something more. There's something beyond this life. It's not just a meal that we're going through the rituals. It really means something. See, the Lord's Supper, I believe, is pointing to another supper. When we share the body and blood of Jesus in this meal, uh, when we do in just a few moments, we're pointing to something else. We're pointing to declaring another meal that's coming with thanksgiving. See, the other meal is what Jesus was getting at when He instituted the supper. He says to them in Luke 22, when He first takes this communion with them, Luke 22 adds this, He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus is saying to his disciples, This is the last time I'm going to eat this bread with you. This is the last time I'm going to drink this wine with you. I'm not going to do it again until the kingdom of God has been fulfilled. And that probably points not only to His resurrection, but to the eternity, the reality of us being with Him forever. Guys, here's something really incredible to consider as we consider taking this meal together. In the end, what we do with the body and blood of Jesus Christ here, the proclamation meal of Jesus' death, is pointing to another meal in eternity. Did you know that the end of the all of creation and the end of the world, when Jesus comes to take us home, we're going to celebrate a meal together. Revelation 19.9 says this, the angel said to me, talking to John who wrote Revelation down, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Listen, I, I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, but I still kind of hope that there's not going to be pie there, or fried chicken, or baked macaroni, uh, I'm pretty sure there's not going to be deviled eggs and deviled ham, maybe angel food cake. But here's what I do know. I do know that there's a meal that's coming that's going to be a celebration of all that Jesus Christ has done for us. And I would bet, based on what I know from the Scriptures, that in some form, when we get to that wedding feast of the Lamb, when we've conquered death and the grave in His name and by His blood, that that, that feast there, like this feast here, is going to have bread and wine. After all, it's the supper of the Lord. It's the supper of the church. And it would just be appropriate that the, the bride and the groom that celebrate this wedding feast in Revelation would have bread and wine there. The difference will be that instead of just these symbols representing the presence of Christ, He'll actually be there and we'll see Him face to face. So with all that in mind, I hope that you've learned a little bit today about what this meal means. We're gonna take the bread that represents the body of Christ. We do this with examination. We do this in community. We do this to remember Jesus and to look forward to a better day. Let's break the bread and let's share this together. In the same way, we go back to that promise of the covenant, the covenant that His blood was gonna be poured out for all of our sins 
We remember it now, but we look forward to that day when we celebrate together in glory with Him. Let's pray. Well, let me bless you before you go. Thank you guys for being with us today. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn His face towards you, make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His countenance towards you and give you His peace. Amen. God bless you guys. See you soon.